So up next, uh, we have Mr. Prasad. He's the CEO of HitDime.com, a cloud analytics uh, service that's owned by Lead Semantics, a semantic big data analytics company founded by Prasad. He's based in Hyderabad, India, and works closely with his technology and business partners in the US. Previously, Prasad founded a telecom analytics company that developed and sold a career-grade analytics appliance built with Quartz hardware, a first of its kind in 2008, offering peter-scale network data mining and analysis at sub.1 million dollar price. So please join me welcoming Prasad this afternoon. Am I audible? Yeah, is that on? Yeah. Well, I think I can still say good morning. We are probably late in the morning towards the afternoon. So good morning again. My name is Prasad, Prasad Yalamanchi. I am founder CEO of Lead Semantics, a semantic big data company out of Hyderabad. Um, we, we have recently released a, a cloud analytics tool on the web. Um, I'll probably have a chance to show a two-minute version of it later on in, in the demo. It is relevant being that, you know, it uses semantic technology. And the topic today is uh, smart big data lake. And uh, before I get going, I would like to, you know, request with a show of hands, how many of you here have heard of data lakes? Quite a few. And if I can get the count right, it's probably about 40%, I think. That's quite a good number. How many of you think data lakes are real and not a mere concept? OK. That's very good, too. Now, one more couple of questions again. How many of you have heard of semantic technology? Little less, sir, but I'm very happy that there are at least 20%. It appears to be 20%. Yeah. And how many of you think semantic technologies are real and not mere concept? There are a couple I'm very happy. I mean, it's, it's probably 3 4%. I would, I would add to that. So hopefully, in my talk, I'll, uh, I'll know where to focus. I'll try and you know, give you a little bit of an insight as to why semantic technologies are real. And most importantly, they solve a very important critical problem that's uh, kind of tagged with data lakes. Yeah. So before we get going, uh, excuse me. Oh, which is it? No, 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 the, the slides, yeah. OK, great. So it's smart big data lake. And the tagline is, you know, make big data lakes deliver analytics today. And hinting in the, in the tagline is that data lakes are not delivering on the promise, you know, what the, uh, you know, what you would normally expect. So I'll start off setting the concept with, you know, where all this analytics situation has begun. You know, analytics over the last several decades, I mean, maybe two or three decades, Data warehouses have been the mainstay of delivering operational analytics to the you know, enterprise organization. More than 80% of the enterprise analytics users get their operational analytics through data warehouses. And these data warehouses are predominantly, they handle structured data, they compute, and you know, one way or another generate all these multi-dimensional views through BI and visualization tools that you know, all of us have grown very familiar with. And they are, you know, being that they have been around for last two or three decades, as we said, the mature practices of governance and things like that have kind of led the entire analytics to be, you know, you expect higher quality out of this entire pipeline. You know, so they have a role to play even in all this changing world. But given the situation that, you know, they deal with majority of the time structured and, you know, relational data, and when you put it against the context today that we are in, where, you know, majority of the data in the enterprise is beginning to be unstructured. You know, it is so unstructured is getting to be more than the structured data. These data warehouses, these venerable data warehouses that have really done their job for so long, seem to be inadequate in this new context. So what do we do with that? So this new world is the new world of big data. And the way it is characterized is that the new data is like the social, you know, the photos and, you know, the, the log data, which is, like, enormous. I mean, you know, we know that log data came out of nowhere, and the amount of insights that, you know, people glean out of these log data analysis is mind-boggling sometimes, you know, security particularly. 
you know, and the call center data, I mean, on and on, geolocation data, that's kind of, you know, again, in terms of volumes and, you know, the types of data that it throws up uh, are different and, you know, something that you cannot handle it through data warehouses of, you know, the previous decades. And the scale, you know, all of this has, you know, this is no news to you guys, you know, given that, you know, the, the confluence of the big advancement in automation and data collection and, you know, all these data center, you know, computations and, you know, all this stuff have led to this, you know, the scale of, you know, data being collected, processed, and, you know, now to be able to generate insights out of that, you would need to do analytics with this big data and, uh, and over and beyond the, you know, data warehouses that we are familiar with. So all this, you know, data that is being, you know, analyzed, it's by these new age techniques like machine learning, graph analysis, social network analysis, I mean, all of these interesting things. You know, all these things are being done by very expert, highly skilled engineers and scientists in the, in the organization. And typically, these analyses are kind of directed towards a smaller group of, you know, folks inside the organization. As we said, operational analytics still is the main staple. And that, you know, predominantly serves probably about 80% of the analytics users, right? And so this big data analytics serves a smaller group, but it, these are high value. They're pointing to kind of, you know, very important directions that the company ought to take. And these things are delivered to the users through very special one-off kind of, you know, user interface, because, you know, old world BI visualization tools did not have a place for these types of, you know, user interfaces that can cater to the new analysis. So only now recently, you know, like for example, um, over the last couple of years, we have been seeing that, you know, the, the yesterday's BI and visualization tools have started ad adding interesting plugins and add-ons that require considerable, you know, configuration and setup and so on. It's not natural. They were not organic. So it looks like there is some, uh, you know, some room for new players to come in and, you know, add in new tools there. And the other thing that we are seeing is that, as you all have seen, at least 40% of you are already aware of data lakes. Current scenario in big organizations, some organizations for sure, there are multiple big data clusters. Each of these clusters kind of, you know, doing one, this high-end analytic, for example. Like, you know, if you have a graph analysis that's trying to kind of, you know, get you new insights into the data, then there is a cluster of big data that is kind of set aside for graph analysis. There is another big data cluster that is doing, you know, social network analysis, for example. You know, and machine learning, for sure. You know, things like that. So within an organization, you are ending up with multiple big data clusters. So you need a new level of abstraction to kind of handle all this you know, different clusters. This is at a different scale. And that is where, you know, we are coming into the term called data lake, as experts call this. And they characterize big data lakes as, you know, a single point of ingest. When you are dealing with these additional sources of data, like Facebook data, Twitter data, log data, and all of these things, these are individually different sources. Each of them at the ingest point will be done very little ETL, so to speak so as to retain all the, you know, the, the provenance and, you know, the traceability to the source. So each of these additional sources will have a place in the data lake, and this would be one single ingest point. These are the two characteristics of the, the data lake. So, for example, in an organization that has a data lake, all the input sources will have individually defined spaces there. You can actually locate them. If can. So each of these things you know, uh, is a different source. Like, you have video and movies and, you know, things like that. They will all end up actually finding a identifiable spot in the lake. So now, what happens? Because there is very little ETL done. When a, a data science team comes up with a wonderful new analytic that they want to calculate with this input data, they will have to kind of, you know, promote a project that ends up having to do the ETL necessary to bring in all these, you know, pieces of data from all these sources you know, towards a target schema specific to that analytic. So all that exercise is kind of deferred. It's kind of late binding, so to speak. So that work is not going away. It seemed kind of, you know, pretty interesting at the, you know, on the, on the upfront saying that, you know, you are able to collect all data into the data lake, but the work necessary for individual analytic is still there. And it is now thrown on the backs of, you know, the data scientists who are normally skilled on, you know, very valuable other things that we talked about. So that is one of the other things that need to be sorted out. And the other important thing is that, being that this is a newer concept, the governance that we are so familiar with the data warehouse world, that is still evolving. You know, the governance that kind of, you know, talks about security and access controls, you know, and 
all those you know, uh, curation of data, for example, all these things are very important things so that you can promote quality and expect quality on the other end of the pipeline. So that is still in the, you know, still evolving. So the important thing is the benefit of, at least, I mean, we should not, you know, write off these, you know, data lakes. They are wonderful concept. It is a higher level abstraction. It, you know, it gives you a chance to kind of do schema and read, so to speak. I'm sure, you know, most of you all uh, have heard about it. What it does is, you know, on an analytic specific requirement, you are able to apply the new schema on this, you know, input data, be it from multiple sources. And you have the flexibility of doing, you know, different types of analytics that way. So the promise is there, but there are certain, you know, logistical issues and, you know, the management issues that need to be sorted out. So where are we now? You know, what can we do about it? We are in that phase as, as where we view it. We are in that phase where things need to be sorted out. And we have a, 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 in summary of the data lakes, for example, I mean, you know, the data scientists are well-dressed and all that, but it seems like, you know, this is the wrong situation for, to be dressed up like that. He looks like he, he needs to paddle a long ways before he gets a clear lake, you know, because it is unwieldy and inefficient at this point, because being that, you know, the repeatable steps of, you know, pure science or reproducible results is not to be, you know, not to be had at this point anyway. So what we think is, and, you know, what should we do to this data lake, which is a wonderful concept, and we look to Gartner, good old Gartner, they set the direction. They say whenever the, you are trying to meet, you know, needs of a wider audience, it is good to have curated repositories. Of course, you know, we all know that even from data warehouse times. You need good governance, and you need good access controls. And additionally, what they talk about is you need semantic consistency, and that is the new thing that has been touted by Gartner. And to do that, you know, being that our world, our experience, our viewpoint is all, you know, semantics, we think, you know, making the data lake smarter is the way to go forward, you know, and we can actually deliver analytics as hopefully I'll make the point going forward. So what is making the data lake smarter? To make it smart, we have to use semantic technology. And what is semantic technology? Semantic technology, unlike the previous technologies, it relies on one very important thing. Within the semantic world, when the data is coming in, all data is uniformly encoded. And this uniform encoding is required by specification of the standards, whatever, you know, that was set. And before I go further on this, I would like to just draw your attention to the pyramid on the right-hand side. It's very colorful. But most of you all probably are familiar with this intelligence pyramid. You know, in computing systems, you know, you collect data, raw data, without any meaning or anything. You apply meaning, it becomes information. So it starts to kind of, you know, make sense for whatever the purpose that you want to do your, you know, computation, for example. You apply context to that, it becomes knowledge. And before you get to wisdom, when you apply knowledge, your wisdom is something that, you know, is what you are after anyway. All analytics exercise ultimately is to deliver automated wisdom. You know, that is like the holy grail of, you know, trying to get into AI and, you know, all of this machine learning and so on. So the higher you are in this pyramid, the more efficient you are because you are closer to the end goal. And as we said, semantic technology, what it does is by insisting that all data that is coming in to be uniformly encoded, it raises the level of computation. It almost makes the algorithms understand the data coming in, which means it is making computation with meaning, which means you are higher up the stack. And how it does understanding, I can explain it to you. Um, you know, in a, in a crude way, maybe it'll make sense. You know, all understanding for practical purposes, you know, when you run into a new concept, new data, whatever, the, you feel like you understood it when you try to compare it with what you know already. And vis-a-vis -vis what you know, comparing it with what you have seen, you judge for it, whether it is right, wrong, or, you know, whatever it is. That simple thing is what really leads to this enormous advantage in efficiency. And so within the first step itself of data ingest, you got all the data with meaning encoded and uniform, and there is no more ETL required after that into the data lake. And this is just at the ingest itself. And that is the first step. And there are many successful implementations of semantic technology. I mean, they may not be as commercially well-known in other areas, but significant systems as complicated as whatever you may be familiar with, 
in defense and intelligence and financial services and research and you know, think, go on and on. For example, in financial services um, in, in the US, you know, citizens when they file taxes, they go through like automated you know, audit through semantic technology solutions. And they tag these things if they kind of you know, go past the threshold in terms of requiring further. They were aggressively pursuing standards for semantic technology, which is unlike you know, the SQL or you know, relational world. What you have now is there are fantastic standards at each level of significant computation in moving raw data to your, you know, whatever the end goal in terms of computation. You have data encoding as RDF, which is standardized. You have schema language, which is modeling language, which is OWL in this case. It's web ontology language. It's equivalent to your relational schema. And then there is a query language, which is Sparkle, which is equivalent to your SQL. So with these three standards in place, now all vendor systems that you know, sell their wares in semantic technology, they, you don't have to worry as a, as, a, as a buyer. You could buy it from one vendor, have your data in that vendor's, uh, you know, whatever the software, you know, and still continue to you know, add in new vendor systems to, to your system while leveraging integration and you know, moving data from you know, vendor one's data, uh, you know, whatever the software, to the vendor's second uh, software. So without regards to any loss of information, meaning, federation, you know, all of that stuff at runtime. So that is a wonderful thing to have when you are you know, trying to latch on to something big. So with the core standards in place, like you know, RDF, OWL, and Sparkle, you know, I'll just get into a little bit of a, a detail in terms of what RDF is. RDF is like storing every bit of atomic information, you know, attribute, so to speak, in the relational world, in, in the form of a, a triplet. You know, it has three constituent parts, subject, predicate, and object. You know, for example, Bengaluru is located in Karnataka. You know, it reads, you know, as it, uh, you know, it meaningfully. There is no more, you know, argument there. Karnataka is located in India. So that is the information that you want to encode. And the RDF stipulates that you use URIs, which we are all familiar with, you know, being in the, in the browser world and web world. These URIs are uniquely identifying what Bengaluru is. So when you see a, a long string of those, you know, geonames, dot, toponyms, you know, pound sign Bengaluru, there is no ambiguity. You know what you're trying to say. When Bengaluru comes in through Facebook channel or Twitter channel or somewhere else, you can at least judge which one is what you want to go with. And there is no ambiguity. And software systems can easily make that judgment for you. And similarly, you know, Sparkle query language here. Like if you are trying to get you know, 50 concepts from DBpedia, the query would read like, you know, select distinct concept where concept and limit 50. You know, it's very easy to read and you can draw parallels to SQL right there. And for ontology, which is the schema, I'm just, you know, I don't expect you to read and follow it, but this is wine ontology as specified by W3C. So if you are in a business of wine, or if you are you know, connoisseur of you know, drinking wine, red wine, or whatever, you need just these concepts, well modeled. So if a business is operating in wine, these terms, if they engage in collecting information in this fashion, there is no ambiguity. You, know, you can easily reason out. And why I say that with little more emphasis than in the relational world is, the concepts are these, you know, the nodes, as you see, and the, the arrows between these nodes are the predicates. You know, we have seen in the triplet, you know, subject, predicate, object, right? The middle one is the predicate, and the arrows here are the predicates. But this is the predicates in the ontology level. Unlike in the, in, in the in a relational world, you have far richer, you know, possibilities for how you define your predicates. You know, like. In the relational world, I'm sure you know there is a, a, an entity, a subclass maybe, and then there is a, a, a relationship and so on. Whereas here you have sub-properties, there are transitive properties, there are on and on, you know? So all that are required to kind of dis disambiguate your understanding of the conceptual world of the domain that you are working with. The more you model it, the easier it becomes for your transactional systems. You can easily validate it. You can reason about it, you know? So it seems a little more complicated, but you know, of course, that is a different phase of work. But once you do that, rest of your you know, operating systems can be a lot more easy and verifiable and easy to kind of you know, add in complex uh, applications.
So now, given you have standards and you have modeling languages, all of that in place, how do you apply to TL? And it all gets uniformly encoded, and the data comes into the data lake. And, and what does that do? What it does is, you know, the data that comes in automatically resolves for all the common nodes, which means it ends up becoming a big graph. It is an RDF graph. When you have a graph, it, it gives you a lot more mechanisms to kind of navigate, understand the context better. It also retains all the formats, the lineage, all of those things. You know, whenever you, for any particular source, if you want to encode more data, for example, you want to encode that, you know, this was collected on a so-and-so date, and which is not part of the data that you have, uh, received, you have received, you can encode it as another triplet and couple it with the data that you are actually storing into the RDF. So all of that information in one single ingest can be collected without loss of any you know, meaning. And it all becomes a graph right after the first point itself. And it retains, it not just retains, it kind of you know, literally opens up the schema and read possibility right after the first step itself. And when I say schema and read, the data points that you receive are individual atomic units. And so whatever the filter, whatever the schema, whatever the application that you want to do, be it machine learning, graph analysis, whatever, I mean, the complicated stuff. You know, you have a way to kind of impose that view on top of this atomic graph, so to speak. And the other important thing, as we said, in data lake, it is very hard to have governance at this point. I mean, I know it is evolving, and I'm sure, you know, there are ways to get there in time. But here, you know, you get that governance also as another layer of ontology another layer of ontology that is added to your you know, schema model, which is the primary domain model, much like if it were a, a, a data lake for wine set of data, you would have that wine ontology, right? And for the sake of governance, it would be another version of ontology targeted at whatever the governance attributes that you are tracking. It, you know, of course, you know, we expect with the governance all the good things like security and you know, uh, access controls and so on and so forth. It allows for curation, and particularly in RDF, it is dynamic. You know, for example, you get a new version of data load that you think ought to replace the prior versions. It is very easy. You know, it's very easy. And so those kinds of things at scale will give you enormous advantage in terms of moving forward down the pipeline for analytics. And the single query, it exposes Sparkle. And as we talked about, it is, it's a standard. So the single query system can now ask all kinds of questions of, of this RDF graph. And that allows for you know, the analysts to kind of you know, come up with radically exciting new possibilities for their analytics. You know, whatever the domain, like you know, in machine learning, you can you know, you, you typically you know, segment out some piece of data out of this big mass of data lake, pull that out, and you know, do your machine learning, for example. You can apply respective queries to pull that data out. As simple as that. The data scientists need not do any more of ETL like in the old data lake world. You know, that is a significant advantage because data, science, data scientists ought to use their skill and technology and, you know, learning in doing data science, not ETL. You know, so that's one of those big advantages. You know, it elevates the computing, as I said. And it also leads to one very interesting prospect. It actually leads to self-service analytics. You know, we have been hearing literature recently on the web. There are a lot of articles that are written about self-service in the cloud analytics and so on. Now, this is a, a wonderful layer on which to kind of, you know, really start planning those kinds of things. You know, and because this is a graph of atomic all data that is all, all interconnected with meaning, provenance, everything in place, and with a standard query language, now we are allowed to make queries. I mean, all you need is a text interface that connects, uh, you know, your query back to the graph. You know, of course, you have to have your semantic models and you know, all that, which is the schema and such. It may be a little more complicated than you know, what I'm making it look like, but it, there is a very clear path. So as the big data becomes smart, you know, how do you actually you know, get to that end goal of you know, delivering analytics? First, as I said, you, know, you have to do the semantic model. You know, semantic model is like you know, when you are having you know, 10 different data sources, for your entire business, for example, for this unstructured data handling, let's say. You kind of harmonize the meaning across all these sources. So you are going through that phase of you know, bringing it all together. And there are support mechanisms in this you know, seemingly newer field. 
there are established mechanisms like vocabularies and taxonomies which disambiguate, you know, you're, you know, when you're sitting around, all the analysts sitting around trying to, you know, hash it out, what should be the right meaning, you have support from these standard things, like, you know, what a word should mean. You have, you know, you have support from taxonomies, you have support from vocabulary, so to speak. You know, like any given segment, like there are ontologies for defense, there are ontologies for education, so on and so forth. And there are a lot of research organizations, institutes, they publish these ontologies on the web. And so you can take advantage of those things that you didn't have to, you know, spend money to develop. And the other thing is that you, during the ingest, as we said, ingest is a very critical, interesting, exciting phase. You know, you do the mapping and transforming, applying the semantic model. You know, and that adds the input data to the, you know, RDF graph. And so it, RDF graph, the basic graph keeps growing. So all data that's coming in is all basically connected without lossless, uh, you know, lineage back to the source. And you can do, you know, because the data lakes are meant to be across a lot of data, you're talking about petabyte scale, uh, at least. So you are talking about, you know, cataloging so that you, you have a way to kind of meaningfully segment this data. And so all that is part of, you know, how you organize your ontologies. And it allows for, you know, master data management as well as a side effect. Master data management, you know, if you are from the relational world, it's a, it's a big deal. You know, it's a separate project that you have to carve out and it's a big deal. With, uh, of course, it is a lot of, it is work involved, but it is fundamentally supported from the ground up. So it makes it easy and you can really apply your higher level skill and thinking to kind of, you know, formulate what you need to do with massive data. The other interesting prospect with semantic data lakes, so to speak, is that you have access to linked open data. Linked open data is this wonderful thing, you know, that has been coming out with, uh, you know, a lot of big governments and uh, research organizations have spent billions of dollars doing research in cancer, for example, or weather, and, you know, so on and so forth, put out all the result data onto the web for, pu you know, public consumption. This is at an enormous cost. All the data is accessible. It is all published in RDF, and you are able to leverage that if your systems are in, you know, semantic, te use semantic technology, and that's for free. So if, if your data lakes are smarter, now you can aspire big. Now you can actually plan on doing the next thing. And the next thing is to actually convert that into a smart analytics platform. And at Lead Semantics, we try to do that. So we use HDFS as the, you know, the scalable storage layer. And then uh, on top of that, there is an in-memory cache layer that kind of, you know, helps you, you know, query this at runtime, both for querying purposes, as well as when the ingest happens to apply the semantic models kind of before actually striping it onto these HDFS layers. The ingest happens through any platform, like Spark, for example. You know, you can, you know, run off background jobs using Spark, all input data gets uh, funneled through Spark jobs and applied semantic model and then it gets added into RDF graphs and they get striped across this, uh, you know, HDFS uh, uh, Hadoop cluster. And you end up with a, a single query interface and that gives you a chance to kind of, you know, come up with, as I said, you know, BI and visualization, modern BI and visualization tools that can completely navigate the entire lake. Of course, you know, given that if you, if you expect these visualization tools to be running in browser, you have natural limitations in terms of, you know, how much they can handle in queries and so on. That you can easily add on. As I said, there are many, many ways to add on these constraints in a systematic way, you know, to the ontologies and so on. And we have come up with a, a tool called HIDDIME. You know, HIDDIME stands for uh, Hidden Dimension. And it's an analytics interface. Um, it uses Sparkle to go against these lakes. You know, I'll, I'll hopefully I'll run a two-minute small demo to kind of, you know, showcase, being that, as I said, you know, it uses semantic technology, it may be relevant. Um, so with the smart analytics platform, you can do analytics that are driven by the semantic model, which means it gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of what analytics you can do. You know, you can do reasoning and inferencing. You know, reasoning and inferencing gives you a chance to, you know, add in new data that was not in your source channels, they, that never existed, but this is consistent data that when you add will give you new insights. And you know, you are perfectly fine in using this new data and that's all computed through this, you know, additional processing called rules and, you know, reasoning. And with, you know, complex models, 
you can do all your you know advanced analytics with the system so that you know we strongly believe that empowers the analyst with a single query interface you know the analyst can build their you know purpose as I, as I discussed earlier they can build their analytics specific segmentation of the you know big data lake bring it out and apply their analytics and you know do their analysis and it you know allows for you know new age bi and visualization tools these visualization tools they can deliver not only the old world operational analytics they can also deliver this you know new age analytics as well so i will take like a, a minute and a half or so to kind of you know showcase a small demo of hidime in this case you know we are trying to showcase a an operational analytic which you may be easily able to relate being that you know you can see that in other visualization tools like for example in this case an e-commerce company it wants to incentivize each month buyers who directly influenced new purchasers you know a buyer has bought in one time they have influenced other buyers later on and so they want to incentivize the first buyer you know so it reads like this you know the fine customers who bought apple products in this case we have some data about apple and so on you know in april of 2015 again we have that data and tweeted positively whose followers have purchased apple products post april 15 so that is you have a causal chain so that you can be sure that you know we are getting the right thing so without further ado i'll just run the demo just a minute and a half if you just will bear with me this runs in a cloud environment you know in the browser so this is you know different data sets are getting selected you know you are selecting the different categories like we said customers who purchase uh, in a certain period time period and apple products and so on so that uh, happens here all of this you know these are like a dimensional cube related stuff up front you know but that is that's what i'm trying to say at the, at the bottom even though it is an rdf graph you are able to deliver operational stuff you know easily being that you know this data is across four different data sets you would have to combine these things uh, and in the case of a rdf graph you can reach out to any far flung attribute you know from wherever you are because you know it is connected one way or another you know so it's easy to kind of you know write out your queries to kind of get there so it is getting all that information it finishes in some time it's more than anything it's just to showcase that you know you are able to actually query seemingly tabular data build your you know cubes dynamically i mean this cube layer is on top of the graph you know the grid layer is on top of the graph so graph is your final substrate you know this is the final graph that shows you know all the followers that actually bought it pulls out that attribute you know if you can read the date is actually you know either later part of april or in may yeah i think it closes right here and it is showing the sparkle query on the left hand side as well so you know so just to showcase that you know all that interactions all that was done through interaction and the equivalent query is on the left hand side it's in sparkle so with that you know i would say thank you and do i have time for q and a i'm sorry okay all right Hiddime in innovation revolutionizing numbers and data. You will no longer be detouring, but making dollars out of your data. Hiddime makes it easy to explore BI data warehouses by business analysts. A simple yet powerful next generation BI tool makes analytics very easy and accessible to any person. Hiddime provides the flexibility to bring down a minute level of data without running any complex queries or script. It incorporates cognitive thinking and converts big data into smart data using semantic technologies. Any business, manufacturing, retail, e-commerce, mobile wallet, agriculture, health, insurance, with Hiddime, your smart data is at your fingertips when triggered by a point and click. A revolution in business intelligence tool 
Hid Dime's dynamic insights substantiates corporate goals and empowers frontline managers and any domain specialists in making day-to-day -day decisions no need for huge investments in IT infrastructure. No IT SQL knowledge required. All you need is a browser. With HidDime, you are your own data analyst, data engineer, and data scientist. Connected graphs, dimensional cubes, pre-canned reports, and all visual analytics are one click away, on cloud, on premise. Multiple people can work on same data sheets simultaneously wherever they may be around the world. From dissonance to resonance, HidDime will change the phase of data analytics and revolutionize the way data can be analyzed and improve your business. HidDime, at point and click, connects art of business with science of data. Thank you so much. Uh, we really hope you enjoyed that session by uh, Prasad. If you have any questions, uh, you know, he's welcome to take them offline. I'm sure he'll be more than happy to take your questions. So if you have anything, you can always walk up to him and have it uh, clarified. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Prasad. With this, we move on uh, to our next uh, session. And the question is, can we reach 1 billion without 1S and OS? So we have with us today Juhi Bhatnagar, who's head of analytics at Clover uh, Infotech. She has an experience in various analytic uh, roles in industries across India and abroad. Over the last few years, she has been involved in conceptualizing diverse data science projects and setting up captive analytics divisions for leading organizations in India, UAE, and uh, US. When asked about her love for analytics, she says that it began when she published a chapter on white light inferometry during her research internship in Norway. Welcome, Juhi. Let's put our hands together and welcome her this afternoon. I'm sure we can clap louder than this, yeah? Thank you.